Okay, we're recording, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to introduce Milo. I've known him for for quite some time, and so um, I want to kind of give you guys an idea of who we're talking with here. So I've prepared a little introduction. I hope Milo doesn't get embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Milo retired from the U.S. Armed Forces, or the Air Force, rather, after 37 years of active duty, reserve, and as a civilian employee. He worked as an aircraft mechanic, along with electronics and software programming, as far back as punch tape. And if you've any of you experienced punch tape, yeah, you know that we're going back a ways. Milo's been woodworking since his childhood. But after retiring, he went full time into custom woodworking using, quote, normal power and hand tools, unquote. <laughs> okay. And then it was Doug Penny in Colorado who got Milo started using CNC machines. He soon discovered that CNC tied his past experiences together with the hardware, software, electronics, and his woodworking interest. The learning curve on running a CNC was steeper than Milo anticipated, and he started out pretty conservative, like many of us, while running parts using slow speeds and high or slow feed rates and high spindle speeds. He constantly continued picking up more and more information on improving the quality of his cuts. Milo spent his time with Ron Reed of precise bits to learn how router bits function. After taking a very close look at the mechanics of the CNC and programming with CADCAM software, Milo started adjusting a few parameters. He got better results, adjusted a few more, got even better performance, and just kept going. I do very little production work, says Milo. Most projects are one-off custom work. I try to push the machine and software as far as I can making adjustments, then push farther. I don't know the limits and you don't know the limits until you find the point the machine and software start to degrade the cut or the design won't come together. Well, unquote, I personally have known and worked with Milo for several years. His uh, curiosity and thirst for knowledge drives him like no one else that I have ever known. Um, and I often rely on his experience and his knowledge while developing the software to control the CNC and also a conversational cam or CCAM to program co the code that takes full advantage of Legacy's three workstations, and especially the turning center with adjustable bed. So I'm excited to turn the time over to Milo Scott and learn from his experience and knowledge as he shares what he's learned about feeds and speeds. Milo, you're on. Okay, I think I'm unmuted here. I'll share my screen. Uh, somebody just kind of wave if you're seeing chip load on the screen now. Yeah. We got it. Uh, <clears throat> first time I heard chip load, I had, had no idea what it meant. And after talking with Ron Reed, if anybody's ever talked with, uh, with him, he will give you enough detail to where you can hang up an hour later and say, what did he say? Uh, Ron has a lot of detail in his head. And uh, he will try to talk with you until it gets into your head. Uh, basically, the chip load is a chip thickness. It's exactly the same thing. And <clears throat> anytime you see a chip load dimension, if you take a uh, digital caliper, you can measure the chip, and it will come out exactly as you had it set. Uh, the first time I did this, I said, no, it can't be that simple. And I was over at Doug's, we were working through this with Ron Reed, and we would measure the chip, and it was a little light, a little thin. We'd change the feed and speed rates, get it up, and uh, pretty soon we could get the exact thickness of the chip based on the feed and speed we were putting into it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you got a pocket knife or a hand plane or a card scraper, they all have a chip load. Anybody that's ever run a hand or a card scraper, if it gets dull and you are pushing it real hard, it gets so hot you can't hold on to it. Well, the same thing goes with the router bit. If you're pushing it real light and it's spinning in place, it generates heat. And heat will kill a router bit. It will kill motors. Heat is not a good thing on almost anything. Well, the chips are actually designed to pull the heat away from the bit while it's cutting. And a bit with a proper chip load can actually end up cooler 
at the end of the cut than when it started. And to test that theory out, I got a heat gun, you know, one of those no contact guns. I shot the bit, I surfaced the entire table at about 300 inches a minute, and I had the chip load and RPM set right. The bit was actually cooler than when it started, is that it pulled the heat out of it. And as it sat there, I kept looking at it, and all of a sudden the bit started warming up. And I said, okay, how could that possibly be? It's just sitting there. So what it was, was the heat in the bearings and in the spindle started to transfer down into the bit. I surfaced it again. It came off cooler than when it started. So you get it set right, uh, the bits should not be hot. You should be able to touch it when you're done cutting. Uh, the first time, be pretty uh cautious when you go to touch a bit that has been running uh, it should actually be just above room temperature and uh, if it's super hot you're moving too slow or you're spinning it too fast the aim is to get chips not dust and even in mdf you can get chips uh, the last time i surfaced the three by five pro I was running over 800 inches a minute and I was, wasn't taking off very much, but the chips were well over the size of a the pencil there. Uh, a thicker chip will actually take more power to run, which makes sense. You're taking a bigger bite. A thinner chip will create more heat the chips, the thin chips can't take the heat away from the bit as quickly. Uh, it will lower your bit life. The heat on the cutting edge will dull the, the edge of the bit. And saying, okay, well, that's good enough. Chip load is chip thickness. And if you don't know what thickness you're aiming for, it isn't doing you any good anyway. Almost every manufacturer has chip load charts, all but one or maybe two are exactly the same. At Hall Manufacturing, we're going to look at just a quarter inch bit soft plywood. They're saying that the chip load should be between 11 thousandths and 13 thousandths. U.S. router tool for softwood plywood, exactly the same, 11 to 13 thousandths. Now this number over here that you see on this screen grab, I grabbed it off of the internet. Well, they had put in 12 RPM and there isn't a bit of, or a machine out there that I know can be 12. Probably when they grabbed it, they knocked off a, a bit. But these numbers down here calculate out to 12 RPM on this feed rate of a quarter inch a minute. So these people are using exactly the same uh, calculations and exactly the same criteria. Here on Vortex tool, they have got soft plywood, exactly the same numbers. PDS spindle out of Germany, it's all in metric. If you do the softwood, plywood, if you convert these millimeters to inches, it is exactly the same. It's 11 to 13. Six millimeters is as close as we get to a quarter inch. A man of bit is a little different. They're not quite as heavy of a chip load. This one, they're a lot lighter. They're by a factor of 10 lighter. And this is in wood plywood and they're at 1,000th instead of 10,000th. And this is on their colorful bits. Why is that? I got an opinion that I probably shouldn't say because I've seen a lot of amount of bits break. Okay. And, and they dull quicker than some other ones that I have used. Um, but, you know, hey, if that's what they are recommending, then that is what you should be using for their bits. Uh, it could be a different uh, 
flute geometry. It could be a different uh, cutting angle. I mean, it could, and of course, they know their stuff best and they know their limitations best. So it's like most things, kind of listen to what they're saying. Uh, like I'd mentioned, the, the formulas are very, very simple. It's not high level math by any means. Uh, and this, I will get to Tracy. Oh, actually, I think I already sent it to him. So whatever he wishes to do with that, I've got some uh, links in here. Now, precise bits is Ron Reed. He is about, here, let me drag this thing off there here because you're probably getting a gray image. Precise bits, he's about a mile and a half from where I live. And he uh, manufactures these bits in a company out in Wisconsin. But his main office is here in Colorado. Under the resources, he's got feeds and speeds calculators in here. He warned you and uh, basically if you do this, you know, use it at your own risk. Uh, now, Ron Reed does things a little bit different on his calculations and for his reasoning. Uh, other things in here, he's got like a sweet spot test and a cutting pattern. And then he goes through, he explains to run this pattern. And then you take a real close look at the chips. And you look in the bottom of the cuts, you look at the side of the cuts, you look at the transition points. Because in here, see, we didn't want to run with the grain. Running slightly across the grain will give you a different cut than running directly with the grain or directly across the grain. Here, you're going to have acceleration factors. You're going to get up to full speed before you got to decelerate to make the corner. Then it's got to accelerate, run full speed, decelerate, and so on. And you can see the patterns on the side walls of these cuts change in how they look on an acceleration, <clears throat> full speed and deceleration. So there's, there's quite a bit to this silly thing. And let's get down here and let's get back to here. Harvey Performance Company is another one that had a lot of detail. Uh, this will put you to sleep in a heartbeat. Or if you like doing this kind of stuff, I mean, it, it shows a lot of information. Uh, these are primarily metal cutting bits, but they do have wood cutting bits that they explain into here as well. So there is a lot of information out there. Trouble is trying to sort through it. And as they say, there is an app for that. Vortex Tool has an app that you can load up on your telephone. And it will sit here and type of material. They can help you select the proper bit. And they got a regular chip load calculator. Some people say it's working, some people say it isn't. Well, you just take a look. <clears throat> but again, this is not a uh, difficult thing to do. Vetric put in a chip load calculator, I don't know, version 9, 5, maybe 10, where they started to include that right in your uh, tool database. As soon as you put in the number of flutes, then this will populate. As you change the feed rates and the RPM, this will alter. Now, of course, you don't know, or you know, they never had in here as to what uh, tool database you are using. But here is where you're using that. A hardwood 0.01 is almost what I use all the time. It's right in the middle of the uh, suggested range from nine thousandths to eleven thousandths. So I just pick it in the middle. <clears throat> Now, I've also done a spreadsheet. People that know me know that I do a lot of spreadsheets. 
simply because it was simple for me and I hadn't found a lot of this other stuff when I had done that. And this did not exist uh, when I was, when I put together this spreadsheet. All I did was take the vortex table and stick it in here so that I've got a quick re uh, reference point. This MDF, pushing it up to here, yep, you will not get uh, dust out of it. Well, you'll get some residual dust. Excuse me, Milo. Yep. Uh, on, the, on that Vetric chip load calculator, can you plug in your chip load and it will recalculate your feeds and speeds? No, it does it the other way. It always goes speed and feed and then tells you the chip load that you've got. And uh, yeah, sometimes I'd like to put in the chip load, but you know, which variable do you want it to calculate probably is what they went after. Is, let me pop up this spreadsheet. Now, it isn't simply, you know, you can change the RPM or the feed rate or both to adjust your feed rate or to adjust your chip load. The amount of flutes make a difference. You know, some people are looking at three flute, four flute cutters. Uh, most of the time with the equipment we've got, one flute is about more appropriate than uh, you might think. Let's see, let's go here to a uh, spindle speed of 15,000 seems to be pretty popular to people. With a two flute cutter in hardwood with a 0.01 chip load, and that is 0.01 inches when you measure the chip, you gotta be pushing 300 inches a minute in order to achieve that. If you can't go that fast, because whether your machine isn't properly maintained, you got backlash on the racks, you got the rack too tight, uh, you got a dull bit, you haven't oiled it up lately, you haven't cleaned it, or you know if you haven't done just routine maintenance, and you say either that or 300 just scares the daylights out of it. You could reduce this to a single flute, and that cuts the feed rate in half. You're now down at 150 inches a minute with a single flute. Now the depth of cut also makes a difference is that they, almost all these bit manufacturers are figuring that you're going the depth of the bit or the, the diameter of the bit, you're going that deep. If you got a quarter inch bit, you're doing a quarter inch pass. And that's what these bit manufacturers are saying that their bits will support, except for the amount of bits they were down here at less than one-tenth this. Some of them are up there, but they're down around six thousandths. So if you were up here at, uh, let's say, 20,000. Oops, here, let's change this to 0 0.006. See, now you're at 120 inches a minute at 20,000 RPM with a single flute, two flutes, you got two cutters coming around at the same rate and you'd have to be going twice as fast. If you go to a three flute cutter, three times as fast. Now, if you're running a three flute cutter down at 60 inches a minute and you were trying to get 10 thousandths chip load, you'd have to be down at 2000 RPM. Well, there isn't any torque left in these spindles at 2000 RPM. The best I've seen on the spindles that I'm using, about 10,000 is what I'd recommend for a low level, the lowest level of RPM. And a three flute cutter at 240, you're looking at eight thousandths. So, between ten thousandths and six, there's quite a bit of difference on feed rate. But you can see that if you, you can do it either way, you can either increase the speed of the RPM, you can decrease the feed rate, 
and knowing down here now, let's say you were used to, or you were comfortable before, you'd max out an RPM. And I don't care if this is your handheld router or a router table or this uh, the spindle on CNC. They're all the same. If you got a quarter inch three flute bit, 0 0.001. You are below solid surface material using an eighth inch bit. Up here, you are basically going to burn this bit up. That's what it's telling. Is that thing is going to be hot? It'll be smoking when it comes off that part. And it's going to be dull. And if that's what you have to run, just know for that you're going to go through more bits. You're going to, you know, you're going to dull them. So basically that is how and what chip load is and what it'll affect you. If your RPM is too high, you're gonna burn wood, you're gonna heat up the bit, you're gonna create more dust than you are chips. There's a balance between RPM, feed rate, depth of cut. If you notice up here and almost on all of these manufacturers, the diameter of the bit you use the recommended chip load in their tables. If you go twice the depth as of the diameter, quarter inch bit, you're gonna cut a half an inch deep. You wanna reduce the chip load by 25%. If you go three quarters of an inch deep on a quarter inch bit, you gotta reduce that chip load by 50%. And that's still cooking right along. Usually, and I'm talking to Ron Reed, and I've done some testing on his bits. And he said, if you break them, you come back, I'll get you another one. Uh, his V bit, I was breaking them in a, about an inch and a half. And I finally, I could barely move. He finally redesigned that bit on a 30 degree V bit. And he said, you aren't gonna listen to me anyway. He said, just do whatever you're gonna do and then tell me what you did. I finally got it up to 400 inches a minute. I started off the board, went cross grain and hickory a half an inch deep. And that bit survived. They're way stronger than you think. Uh, if your spindle is misaligned, let's say that you hit it, you hit something on the table, uh, you rammed it into the bed and the spindle can be out of alignment clockwise, counterclockwise as you're looking at it, or forward or back. Let's say you bury the bit into the bed as it's going full speed and it torques it to the rear. If you don't realign that spindle, you know, if you think about it, you're going to be coming down into the wood at an angle. You're going to put a lot of side load on that bit. More than likely, you're going to break them. So if you're breaking bits, it's usually because something is misaligned or you bought, you know, 10 for a dollar off Amazon. You know, obviously they're not the same quality of carbide. Uh, if you overcut with a bit, if you're cutting an inch deep with a three quarter inch cut length bit and almost everybody has tried it, <clears throat> well, the shaft of a bit is the size you know they advertise it as a quarter inch bit well that's the shaft that is before it is shaped and before it's sharpened all of them are going to lose diameter and so a quarter inch bit if you have it in your database as a quarter inch i can almost guarantee it's wrong a quarter inch bit is usually cutting closer to 0.245 instead of 0.25 but if you're overcutting the flutes and you're rubbing the sidewall, you're generating heat. You're going to heat that bit up. You're going to, you know, wear down your uh, front edge of the cutter. A V bit, I didn't know the difference, is the only cutting portion is the V. Even though they got spiral flutes on the side of it, those are not sharpened. And I didn't know that till Ron Reed told me and he thought I was... You know, I should have known better. 
the um, climb versus conventional. This was kind of interesting to me. And this came from uh, Harvey Performance. And they threw in a few extra terms that I had not heard of before. This TEA, I thought it was something you cooked up in a pot, but it is tooth engagement angle. And you'll notice here, if you're at a 50% step over with a bit, that is where you get full engagement of the cutter and full chip load or the full chip thickness. As the cutter comes down, you're at a 90 degree cutting angle. Well, if you do an offset, and heaven only knows why they use these numbers, but that's what they wanted to do. 12.7 degree or percent step over. Now, oops, you are running. a 41 degree engagement angle. Different side pressures, different bit deflection, different everything, different chip thickness. Now these are assuming the same feed rate. And so when you do a short step over, you're actually doing a way less chip load. So you could technically speed this up a lot more when you're doing a small step over. And that's what I drew up here. And if this is rotated around, these would be the size chips in this area of the cut. Now, a, the way I got this set on here, this side is climb cuts. This side is conventional cuts. A climb cut, <clears throat> you're climbing into the wood. And if you try to do this with a hand router with a 50% exposure of your bit, you can't hold on to it. This thing will rip this uh, router right out of your hands. The only thing that uh, you know, enables you to do this on a CNC machine is because you got a thousand pounds of gantry up there holding the back, you know, and it's built for it. But here, see, you're cutting into supported fibers. Wood fibers are just like a bunch of fingers or straws. And as you are cutting down on them, all the fibers underneath are supporting the cut. You get a nice clean cut. A conventional cut like you would do on a handheld router, is you're cutting into the wood and there's nothing back here because it's already gone. However, when you come up here, you're gonna shatter these top fibers loose. You're gonna just snap them off and you're gonna get big, long streaks of broken wood. But sometimes that's the best cut or what you need to do anyway. As you, do a step over, and this looks like I drew it at about 25% or so. These are the size chips. This is the full 50%. This is this one stepped over. You notice something else different here on a conventional. Let's see, I forgot here. I'm sorry, the, the climb on this side. You start out cutting. When the bit hits the wood, you're going full engagement. And then you taper down to nothing. So you got a lot of pressure at the start, less pressure as it's coming out. Whereas a conventional cut, you're starting out very thin, going to very heavy. So these tight cuts will give you different results. And then, all this stuff to get you confused, you know, grain direction. Anybody that has ever held a hand plane and planed the board, you get instant feedback if you're going with the grain or against the grain. And luckily a router bit, it isn't nearly as uh, involved 
as you know, using hand tools. But with the grain, if the grain is running up and you're cutting across with a router bit, you're going to get a really clean cut. If the grain is going this way and you're running the bit this way, you're going to, you're going to tear out the fibers. You're going to get a rougher cut. Uh, cross grain. If you've ever done cross grain on a router, you don't get any tear out until the very end where you break out of the board. So that's our cross grain. Well, end grain is when you roll it up this way and you're cutting you know, through here. You got support of all these fibers going up. You get almost no tear out on these bits. You can take the proper chip load, it cuts like a dream. Uh, the climb cut is supporting the cuts. Now, sometimes I will stabilize the grain on a, on a delicate cut if I'm coming down into a V shape and I know I'm gonna tear this grain out because the grain is going this way. I'll cut one side, program in a pause and soak this edge with super glue. Activate it, let it sit for a second, and then come back and cut this side. Actually, what I want to do is cut this way into the fibers so that I don't snap these off. And that seems to work pretty good. Um, like I say, after you see all of this stuff and a lot of theory, you still got to hit the run button. You go to the best that you can. You run it. You look at the cut. Do it tear it up change one of the values, change either the RPM or change the feed rate and see if it changes. If it gets worse, well, don't do that. Change the other one. Um, most of the time, people are running too slow of feed rate or too fast of a spindle RPM. And like I said, it's the same thing on uh, handheld routers or router tables. Or I've seen this a bunch of times. They're using the wrong bits. Those are metal cutting bits. They are not wood cutting bits. They got a really short helical. They usually have four uh, flutes. These, you can't run a, a wood spindle that slow. Uh, these type of bits are what we normally use. Uh, I gotta be able to flip this. This is how they sit in a router table because you chuck us down here. This is how they sit in the spindle. When these things spin clockwise, the upcut bit, if you put your finger in there because you can't tell the difference between an upcut or a downcut bit, put your thumb in the groove and slightly spin it. If it's pulling your fingers up, that's an upcut. It's pushing it down, it's a down cut. Compression bits, you got up cut on the bottom, down cut on the top. Still, it's the same uh, chip loads or these straight cutter bits. They still cut the same chip load. And that is chip load. Has anybody got any questions that have been bugging them? Hey, Milo, I got a question for you. Uh, when you're talking about the back and forth and you're on the straight edge, and so you're going fast and then you stop and turn around the other direction, so now you slow down. I'm having this problem when I'm going back and forth doing surfacing. So I've got my, my feeds and speeds set good for the straight, but then I burn while I'm doing the turnaround. Is there a, a, a good way to account for that or adjust for that? I try to turn around off the piece. I do the same thing. Okay, so go, go big on the piece and, and uh, so you're doing the turnarounds outside? All right, Yeah. that's uh, kind of where I, I started going. I was just wondering if there was a, another trick to it. No, because unfortunately you can't, alter the feed rate within Vetric software. Uh, they have never went to that level of detail. Uh, you know, your machines will automatically slow down based on the acceleration and deceleration values set either in Mach or Delta. 
And if you don't adjust the RPM to match that slower feed, you're spinning in one spot generating heat and you burn especially cherry. Cherry burns if you look at it wrong. Absolutely. So, so when Vectric asks what, uh, what changes we want in version 12, that's what we need to tell him. <laughs> I tell you what, the more you think about it, that would be a tough thing to do. But yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's the same thing. Do you cut with the grain? Or do you cut cross grain? Uh, most people say, well, you'd never cut cross grain. Well, that's the conventional wisdom. But when you're using a hand router, where do you rip out the edge when you're trying to put a nice cove edge? You rip out the edge of the board, hardly ever on the end of the board. So I have started cutting cross grain, especially doing 3D work. And if you think about it, you're cutting very short fibers because you're coming across here rather than coming across here. If following the rules don't work, break them. You know, everybody's always said, oh no, you have to do this. Well, that goes back to hand tools. You know, these power tools do things just a shade different. If I could interject, Chris, one of the things uh, when I was at the school working on a wiki, they would surface their table, they would create a tool path that had radiuses at the end versus the way that Vetric does it where you have a straight square. Um, so it was a continuous radius vector that the tool was following to surface the top of the machine. So it never stopped, it kept going the same speed. It just had to be a big enough radius at the end of the, the end of the uh, tool path to be able to spin around. Milo, would you agree that that helps in that situation? Yeah, and Vectric actually has a spiral gadget. Only thing is, it's got to be a round piece. I mean, if you're uh, surfacing a uh, end cut slab or aisle, just any slab, that, like an end cut off the log, I was doing some on a oak burrow. And it was, I finally figured out that I could make it do a continuous spiral and it kept the same feed rate the entire time. And, uh, but that's a long way around the tree to get there. But, uh, you know, it's like everything else. The companies learn more as their users learn more and start to demand more. Is there a general rule of thumb uh, for a very finished, you want a finished result? Uh, for step over as a percentage of your tool diameter, especially with a, uh, a, a ball nose? Well, they usually recommend, everything I've seen is around 8% of the diameter of the bit. Uh, I find that still leaves a little bit of ridge. And if you got, you know, you're looking at it sideways or looking at it from the vertical, if you are stepping over, you know, that far, you've got this little V down here where those stepovers occur. Well, the tighter you get them, the less waves you're going to get or the less of that ridge. Trouble is, it's a balance. How long do you want to take to get a smooth finish? You know, is you got to run a test cut and you got to do it per type of wood. Uh, and the funny thing is some of these companies will even mention chip load effect on different moisture content of wood. A lot of these tests were done at six to 8%. Go down to Florida and try to find a six to 8% piece of wood. I don't think it exists down in Florida. Here in Colorado, in the middle of winter, we're all over the place. So even moisture content makes a difference. Uh, depth of cut and tool deflection, length of tool, all of that's going to enter in as well. Right now, Ron Reed has several of us testing a long quarter inch bit with a reduced uh, diameter shaft for an extended reach bit. Found out there's a harmonic vibration in that. At certain speeds and certain feed rates, this thing screams like a banshee. I mean, it is terrible, the noise it makes. And so we're trying to get it narrowed in. 
he may have to, instead of doing a straight shaft, do a tapered shaft on it so that the harmonics don't hit throughout that bit. I mean, it's talking to Ron is interesting. And then we've got the machinery that'll take it and run it as hard as we can. And it's resulting in better products on both sides. Hey, Milo, this is uh, Tracy. Um, I'll just kind of share some of our experience here as well. When we're using end mills or surfacing bits, the step over, if you're surfacing, for example, is 40%. That seems to be the optimum number that, that we have used. I don't know if you got experience different than that, Milo. But when it comes time for a, uh, a core box, 8% um, is really pushing it. When we do turning on the machine, using it like a lathe, using a core box bit, if you want a really smooth finish, we have to go down to 2.5% step over you know, for the, the core box bits. So if you're using a one inch diameter, then you go over two and a half percent. If you're um, using, you know, a real fine bit, doing some real fine details, you might be only stepping over a few thousands, but that's the numbers we typically use, 40% for end mills and surface planing, and then anything with a rounded bottom, the optimum cuts two and a half percent. Yeah, the two and a half percent that I've tried, it's a glass finish. Right. I mean, sandpaper would goof it up. Uh, it, it gives a beautiful finish. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, if you're just trying to knock it down and get it turned quickly or do something like that, then, of course, step over farther. But if you're trying to get a, a, a really fine finish on the first cut and be done, then it's 2.5%. Yeah, the other thing that we found that I didn't realize at first, the V-bits. Almost every V-bit has a flat tip. Almost every one of them. Well, if you put it in as an engraving bit rather than a V bit, the step over percentage, if you're used to dealing with percentage, it'll bite you because a V bit with a flat tip or it's an engraving bit in uh, Vetric, the step over is based on the tip. So if you got a 15,000 tip and you do uh, 8% of the tip, you're going 8% of 15 thousandths, not of a quarter inch. Now, if you've got a V bit defined in Vetri, it is a percentage of the diameter of the V. And you can see it when you make the tool path in Vetri, you'll have a mass blue area. And you look real close, the step overs are hardly anything on a engraving bit with a flat tip. So on those, I'll do a 95% step over because it is 95% of the tip and you will still get a flat bottom. It's, it's just a bizarre little thing that until you run into it, you don't even know it's there. Hey Milo, um, one thing that you, you brought up was, uh, was Ron talking about noise and that reminds me of the last conversation I had with him. And that's listening to your speeds and feeds or your feeds and speeds. And if a bit is screaming at you, what he said is that's the, the other flutes coming back and hitting the already cut area. And that is an indicator that you are going way too slow. If you, I, I ran a, a 3D carb once and it just, it hurt to, to listen to that while it was going and it absolutely destroyed my bit. So listening also can give you a good indicator of if you're going too slow. Um, that's, a, that's one I listen for now is, is actually what the bit's sounding like. And I'll crank that speed up if it's, if it's howling at me. Well, the other thing too is on Mach 3. When you run Mach 3 and you want to adjust it as you go, um, down here on the increase and decrease, this is a percentage of the feed rate. Your spindle is actual. So if you are running this on the run and you find that, hey, if I kick this up to 120%, it really sounded good. Well, readjust your software and push this back to 100 on the next run. Because if you run this up to 200%, 
everything is 200%. The Z retract, the Z coming back down, it'll scare the daylights out of you. So you want to readjust your uh, software back to 100%. At least that's what I've come into. Hi, this is Jim Smith. And um, one of the things I've been using is the Vetric. It does tell you your chip load when you set up your feed and speed. So I've been using that to help me set my feed and speeds when I'm doing the, the settings. Yeah, the only thing, of course, they don't have in their uh, uh, help files probably because they didn't dare do it was to tell you what chip load you're looking for. But I, I, yeah, I agree. So you have to use the chip load off from the vendors. But once you know that, then you're saying you just set the uh, setting in Vetric and now you got your two thousands or twenty thousands or whatever you uh, chip load you need for that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Is uh, testing and then observing. Uh, when we first started doing this, measuring the chips was an eye opener that we could actually readjust for a different chip load, ran a test file, and it measured out exactly that thick. Yeah. This is Trace again. I'd just like to mention that, of course, these numbers are based on straight cutters, which is you know fairly easy to calculate. So you do have a couple of variables here that can affect. And one is the geometry of the cutter, the profile. So if it's a, you know, a larger bit, but it's got a, a lot of surface area that's touching, um, then it, it's like going down instead of the diameter of the cutter. You know, if you go down twice the diameter, you have to go 25% of the uh, of the chip loading, et cetera, et cetera. You get the same thing with the geometry of the cutters. Unfortunately, there's not going to be these numbers on any of those other cutters. And so it's going to take a little bit of experience. Uh, you're going to have to kind of pick a target, try it, and then make adjustments. Once you have that dialed in, though, you may want to keep a log of, you know, if you're using a classic spiral cutter, what is the optimum, uh, you know, feeds and speeds that you're getting with that particular cutter. And then it can vary by wood as well. One other question that came up here in the chat was sounded like these numbers were for, you know, the bigger spindle, uh, but it may not work per se with the um, three horsepower. But Milo, you have a lot of experience working with both. And I know that you've pushed the, both machines, um, you know, to the max and probably beyond in a lot of cases. What's your experience with the, uh, the larger uh, spindle versus the little three horsepower that's on the three by five? It'll take a lot more to stall the bigger motor, of course. But these chip loads are on the three horse as, as to what I have tested. I've been, uh, I've run up to 400 on, uh, on Walnut a lot. Uh, now, Doug Penny has got that big, what is that, a six horse? Yeah, it's six, it's six horse, yeah. We stalled it out, but we were doing 600 inches a minute, an inch and a quarter deep <laughs> in a single pass. We sped up the RPM to about 23,000. We did a single pass, inch and a quarter deep, half inch bit. And that was in, I believe, Hickory. We were running the bit to see how far it'd go. That spindle didn't care. It looked like a chainsaw rooster tail coming off that wood. <laughs> and it actually Unfortunately, sounded Tracy, darn they good. bent the frame. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, uh, we need another gantry. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I know that Milo and Doug have pushed this machine well beyond <laughs> its limits and have tested it to the max. So that's why I, I like listening to Milo and his experience because. Uh, we haven't had the chance to do what he has been able to put this through. So I uh, really appreciate all of this feedback and all this information that he's able to share. So uh, Milo? this is uh, Lee Metter. Uh, so are you saying that, uh, isn't there for the three by five, I have gen two, isn't there a, a gantry uh, limit that you can go as far as speed on uh, feet per minute? On the three by five, it's typically set up at 400 inches a minute. That's your rapid positioning move. 
Um, and you can change that in the, well, there you go. Milo's just brought it up. You can actually change this in the uh, velocity in the motor tuning to higher if you want. You know, we have set it fairly conservative uh, when we set it out, but uh, this is how you could push it, um, you know, by a change in this velocity. Whatever this velocity is you're seeing down here at the bottom, the 600, for example, it has here then uh, you can program a G1 with an F600. If you program it for an F650, it would simply limit it at 600. This is the maximum that it'll go. And this is what a G0 will move at. Milo, as we go from the Mach 3 and dip our toes using a Delta, what kind of advice have you got for us to I'm not ready to push your your hickory example yet, but maybe there's some other things that we should know. Push it harder. <laughs> the delta, uh, for instance, on the mock, you're pretty limited in what it'll allow you to adjust in parameters. I mean, there just isn't that many. It's hard uh, coded into the program of the acceleration, deceleration, the ramping, the constant velocity, you know, all of this business. We're in Delta, I don't know, Tracy, how many we got, 100 variables? Oh, yeah. You know, yes. is that you can have it slow down on a tight curve. You can control how fast it's, you know, accelerates, decelerates on a sharp curve. Uh, it's there is a lot more adjustment, which means if you look at the see on mock, this is where it's kind of misleading to to has caught a few people. They would program it say at six hundred, and down here it would show six hundred, even though the motors are maxed out at four. This is the program rate, not the running rate. On Delta, it shows you the running rate. And you'll see it uh, increase, decrease, and how fast or if it'll hit the high points. And uh, when I was doing the 800 on the uh, surfacing, yep, it'd get to the end, turn around, you'd see it decelerate, reaccelerate, come up to speed and then do the same thing every time it turned around. So Delta shows you what it's actually moving, where Mach shows you what's programmed. Mach 4, I understand, shows you running rate. Well, if it's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read out some of the questions from the chat real quickly and make sure these are all covered, and then we'll open it back up for Q&A real quickly. But, uh, um, one question was, is this being recorded? The answer is yes, and it will be put on our website. Okay, so it'll be under class review. Um, so you'll be able to see that. And let me see, I just lost my chat. Here we go. Okay, so um, that's the first thing. This, this has been recorded and it will, will show up under class review under training on our website. Um, we do have some requests here for sessions on CNC maintenance. Milo, you, you mentioned that and how important it is. Uh, I think that would be a great set of classes. So I appreciate the feedback there. We'll use that. Um, and also maybe one on spindle alignment. I could actually uh, show you how we do our tramming uh, here. So if you if you needed to do something there in the field, you would be able to, to do that as well. Um, let's see, down a little bit farther. Um, Oh, there is the question here from Carlos about the three by five versus the four by eight. And it is true that the bigger spindle will, uh, you know, can push a lot harder than the three, three horsepower. But keep in mind that if you take a, a three horsepower router and put it in a router table, uh, you can have a pretty big side, you know, big, pretty big cutter and run that on the edge of the material or, you know, pretty deep. Three horsepower is nothing to, you know, to laugh at. It's a, it's a lot of horsepower still. So you can still push it pretty heavily. The, um, the one thing that came up in here was that the they had a, an idea that the suggested depth of the cut was only half the uh, diameter of the cutter, the radius of the cutter. And you probably got that from us, to be honest with you, because uh, uh, kind of like Milo, when we first started out, we were 
started out fairly conservative, very careful. And so we kept those numbers kind of low. But um, now we, we know I cut all the time with a quarter inch bit uh, through three quarter inch material. And I'll, I'll always do it in two passes, if not a single pass. I'll never go to three passes anymore because it'll handle that even with the three horsepower spindle. So um, that you, you can kind of eliminate the radius of the cutter for the depth and start pushing your depths a little bit higher. I like the charts that you had Milo here on there that showed that if, if you go twice the diameter, you know, you're going to slow it down by or the, reduce the chip load by 25% and so on. Um, which brings up another question here is that can we get this, uh, uh, you know, this information that you've got? And I know you sent me a PDF and I'll be glad to post that, but there's asking questions about the spreadsheets and would they be able to get a copy of the spreadsheet? I'll send that to you as well, Tracy, because that way I got a central distribution point. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll put it on the website under uh, training uh, uh, customer support files. And we'll just put it in there so you, everybody can just download it directly from there. That'll be the easiest. All right, I think I... I think I got everybody's question in here. So I'll go ahead and open it back up for Q&A if anybody else has any questions real quickly. I have a question. Hey, Milo. I had a quick question. I, I missed it if you answered it, which was uh, I see in the note that uh, you're recording this. Where can we access that recording? Okay, I'm going to share my screen and I'll show you uh, here real quickly, okay? All right, so you should be able to see my screen now, and this is our website. Uh, and again, the, the address is LWM, which stands for Legacy Woodworking Machinery. LWMCNC.com. You could also put LegacyWoodworking.com or LegacyCNCWoodworking.com. They'll all go here. But this is the easiest one, LWMCNC.com. Now, once you get in here, if you mouse over training, uh, webinars is where we post. You know, you can submit questions that you want to see in the webinars. It'd be a great place to post that you want to see a maintenance class, for example. And then it's going to have the calendar here and kind of go over some of the other types of training. But if you go into training to class review, Okay, this is where you're going to see the webinar show up. And uh, I, I just got the, um, the video for the last class, last week's class, and gave that over to Chris. And he'll be posting it, so it'll show up here at the top. And then I'll have this one recorded. I'll turn this one over to him tomorrow and see if we can get it posted fairly quickly as well. But again, it's training, class review. I am going to move this class review under webinar, so it'll be one central location that you'll go to, to get all the information about the webinars, including the class review. But for right now, they're separate pages. And again, where Milo was going to send me the spreadsheet, it's going to be under training. Everything's going to be under training for you. Customer support files. And this is where we will we'll put it in here in this list so you can download it. OK, any other questions? Milo, I do have a question. This is Milo. Milo. I, I cut a lot of three quarter inch plywood and um, I use a compression bit on it, quarter inch end mill, one inch long. And instead of me experimenting, because I want to cut it as fast as I can, I've been doing it with three passes. And um, I think I'm going about 240, 250 inches per minute. I think 20,000 RPM. Can I go faster? Tell me the numbers so I don't have to play around and try to figure it out. I know one guy that he is currently cutting three quarter inch stock, one pass compression bit at about 100, 110, and probably around 18 to 20,000. I mean, it truly is, you got to play with it. Uh, ramping has an effect because you, of course, you don't want to stall it by stabbing it into the wood. Uh, so if you ramp in, now if, you, if the top surface is really critical, say it's uh, melamine or something, you want to do a lead in. Come in off the side, lead into your part, and then come around and lead out of your part. Because if that upcut portion hits your surface until it gets deep enough to get past that compression area, you're going to rip up the top. Um, so that's the thing that I would suggest. This is right. Jim Smith again. Uh, I just finished that ornament. If you went over to to Doug Penny's site or the other legacy site that you saw that I cut out, and that I that was half inch plywood, and I ran that at 140 inches a minute, at um with a uh, quarter inch compression bit. So 
And that was five ply, half inch plywood. And that was a single pass, Jim? Oh, yes. I, I've i never tried to do compression multi-pass. I've always tried to go through, do one pass with compression, but now, Jim, MDF, you've, got, I, you've got a Gen 1, right? Yes, I do. Three by five with a three horse. Did it sound good? Yeah, it was, it was noisy enough that I wanted to put hearing protection on, but it wasn't terribly bad. I mean, it did sound like it was pulling the motor down. Oh, no, not at all. It, if it was pulling the motor down, I would have started to panic. I've, ne I've abused that machine in the sense that I've never done anything where I've had that motor seem like it was loaded. So, and That's I do a like, lot of compression big cuts. Like was mentioned earlier, once you know what the sound should be, then you kind of know when it's doing the wrong thing. But it's trying to get to that point where you know what it sounds like. Uh, so all these chip load charts, they're still pretty safe. Well, and that's in my, just that kind of keep you from getting into trouble. And Milo, basically, I started pushing the machine after I saw some of the demos you did maybe a oh. year ago or so where you were seeing the speed. I said, my gosh, I'm just going to start raising the speed more and more on this thing and see what I was always worried about. And I was burning. I had a lot more burn marks than I do now because I'm moving stuff a lot faster. So a bad influence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to sell my Gen 1 so I can get that <laughs> that pro. <laughs> Milo, when, when you, you're trying to get the proper chip load and you're adjusting feeds and speeds, how do you know where to start? I mean, do you, do you start with the feeds first or the, the uh, speeds or, or what, what's the proper way to, to try to dial it in? I, I start out with lower RPMs on the speed simply because I don't like to listen to the darn thing screaming. You know, so that's just a personal preference thing. Uh, and I know I can't go below 10,000. I feel better at 11 or 12,000. And then I adjust the feed to get the chip load that I'm after. I mean, that's how I normally do it. Okay, so the, the, the tool charts that we got from Legacy with the Vetric software has, I think it has all the proper RPMs and everything in it, so we basically run up yeah. that you those gotta be real careful with any I, I didn't mean to step on your trace no go ahead my i'll step in after you be very careful on anything you download i've seen a lot of people assume that whatever is loaded is you know what you should be running but that you know that wasn't for particular tools all the time you know, some of those were for different tool manufacturers. Uh, it has to be per manufacturer. And like I've seen some on the Amana tool database, if you download that, you're going to be smoking bits because they don't know your machine either. You know, they don't know the horsepower of your spindle. Uh, you can push them or you got to back off depending on that. I know one machine that I work with a lot that I won't say the name on, but it couldn't draw a straight line if you went anything over seven inches a minute. Well, you either got to burn up a bit or at least slow down the spindle as much as you can. And this wasn't even a spindle, it was a router. And uh, so sometimes you're within limits, but double check them just in case. I mean, I've seen one that somebody obviously accidentally put in like 10 instead of, you know, a thousand. So yeah, don't be afraid to change stuff. I would I would just mention that uh, a lot of manufacturers will suggest that the minimum is about twelve thousand. I know you've pushed it down to ten, um, but you know you'd probably be a little happier because as you slow down the RPM, you will lose torque, and then you can stall the motor. So I'd, I'd like to push it up a little bit. Um, 
What we have found typically, this is our experience, um, and it's not by any means, you know, the the final word. You're going to have to test, obviously. But uh, you know, I I give a, a ballpark of about 120 inches a minute in most cases, and then you can push it. And of course, sometimes we can push it up to when I'm surface planing a spoil board or the base table. I'm running it at about 400 inches a minute or more. So, um, you know, the numbers that you're going to find in, in uh, Legacy's uh, tool database that goes into Vetric, uh, we haven't had the chance to test every single cutter and find the absolute best. And it's, it's also going to vary because of wood and, and everything else. And so take those with a grain of salt, uh, play with them, uh, be more concerned with the chip load. And now that uh, Aspire has that chip load in there, it's a fantastic tool. You'll want to play with that and... Uh, you know, kind of adjust. You don't use necessarily the numbers that are in there as defaults. They're just generic numbers. Well, one thing I, to mention I, on Mach on the rotary and even on Delta on the rotary, there's some issues there where when I was using the rotary on Mach, grab a hold of the chips. They were very light, and very fluffy. What is that telling you? They're too darn thin. Well, why are they thin? I'm running the same RPM. The feed rate within Mach has some calculation issues that I finally got a tachometer and I tested it and it was running uh, too slow. So to compensate for that, you could, I don't know, Tracy, how fast did you run the rotary on the Mach? I, I push it up to six, eight hundred. Right. When I'm the, you know, the most basic cut turning around is just using a surface planing bit and turn it to a round cylinder. I usually run the rough cut at about 600 inches a minute. Uh, again, this is not true uh, uh, feed rates because of the calculation, but I put them at about 600. And the final cut, because it's real, real thin and real small, I run it at about a thousand. Okay. Now when I'm using uh, other cuts, like I'm cutting a spiral twist with a classic plunge or whatever, a large cutter, two inch diameter cutter, then I'm, I'm running it back down at around uh, 150 to 200 inches a minute. Uh, and I know that's a little bit slower than, again, what we think it is because of the calculation, but surfacing, you can, you can really make it scream. I think we all use a lot of magnate uh, bits. Do we know the chip load for those, those bits? I have never seen Magnate publish a chip load chart. Uh, so on any of their spiral bits, because a lot of these charts that you see are for spiral bits. Uh, but on their straight cutters, I use about the same chip load on a Magnate bit. Now, unless you get the big profile bits, you know, because even on a, a router table, you know, if you got a, a panel raising bit, they tell you, okay, don't go past what thirteen or fourteen thousand RPM, because it sounds like an airplane propeller. Uh, so I mean, it's the smaller bits. I think you're safe to use those chip loads, but I have not. I've looked, and I have not seen any recommended chip loads on their bits. Same, same for me, Tracy. Do you have a comment to that, or something we could yeah, I, I use? I can tell you why they don't have chip loads on there is because, uh, you know, a bunch of those cutters were bits that, that we designed and gave them the, the, the you know, the, the design of the cutter, and they have those custom ground for us. So they don't, have not taken each one of those cutters, because there's, you know, over hundreds, over a hundred, and tested each one for, you know, optimum cut and chip load and such like that. So they're not going to provide anything. You would have to use, um, you know, charts from these other manufacturers. Um, and again, it is going to take a little bit of experience depending on your spindle, your uh, wood, and, so, and the geometry of the cutter. Unfortunately, there's not just a magic number that you can use. You're going to have to, you know, kind of set it. And again, I play with 120 inches a minute to start with. And then um, I will a lot of times, and you might want to do just a test cut, just in a piece of wood, you know, a piece of scrap, but run it to 120 and then just play with the RPM or play with the, the, the feed and tell you here and see the performance that you want with those odd geometry cutters. Thank you. Tracy Lee Menner here. Can I ask about the uh, 
working with CCAM. I noticed that uh, doing uh, like the turning round for small diameters, it goes pretty quick. But right now I'm trying to do a project that's uh, six inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And I've got it all set up, but it seems like it takes forever to just do a turning round. Yeah, push. Uh, you have two feed rates in turning around in, in CCAM. One's the rough cut, one's the finished cut. What are you running those numbers at? The the the, the defaults are three hundred and three fifty, which are really really slow. What do you know? What you're running those at? Are you using the default, or are you increasing those feeds? Well, I actually just kicked it up to five hundred and seven hundred. Okay, you can push it higher than that. Like I say, I push it at 600 in my rough and you can typically go higher than that. And I go to uh, about a thousand in my finish cuts. Um, and I'll give you a heads up. I, I cut, when I'm cutting pine and turning like that, a lot of times I'll have it programmed at 600 and I'll use, in Delta, I use the slider bar and I push it all the way up 200%. So I'm cutting, I'm just turning 1200 inches a minute as I'm blowing through that material. Keep in mind that when you're turning around, you have a, a pass depth, um, and uh, because you, you, it's a little deceiving because you let's say for example, I use a pass depth of three eighths of an inch with my surface planing bit for turning around, which sounds really intense because that's an inch and a quarter flat surfacing bit, but your step over is, is small as you rotate, and so you're not really cutting that much material, and that's why I can push those numbers so much higher. Again, the original numbers were extremely conservative at 300 and 350, but I'd go to 600 to 1,000 uh, and even push a higher net just by using, in mock, use the uh, percentage, you know, increase and decrease. On Delta, use the slider bar, um, and you'll find what, what works well for you. And Quick you also recommend mock. doing the uh, cutting, the, the, the cut depth to like three, you know, for both, I mean, because I don't need a, a smooth, uh, smoother because I'm doing uh, basically uh, profiling the whole thing. But so I can I do both the, the, the finish and the other at three quarter. Yeah, I'd use three eight for my plunge depth, but you have a step over for a rough cut and a finish cut. And so it's uh, uh, it's uh, set up, you know, bigger on the uh, I think it's three eighths of an inch on your on your rough cut, and the finish cut's only about an eighth of an inch, if I remember right. I'd have to open it and look at it. But if you're just getting it rough and you don't care what the finish is, then change your finish cut, the last one, to match your rough whatever the rough cut is calling for in the software, and it won't be as as smooth or as finish, you know, as, as beautiful, but it'll it'll cut three times faster on that finish cut as well. So, so I have one question about mock. Yeah. There's a spot in the lower left hand corner that asks you to put the diameter of the material in. Is is that used to adjust the uh, speed based on the diameter of the wood? Yeah, that's the same thing. Milo, do you want to take that, or do you want me to cover that? Yeah, I've done quite a bit of testing on this as well. Uh, when I started putting a tachometer on there, because what caught my attention was how fluffy the the chips were. And so speeding up the cuts on the rotary, you got to be real careful because if you're doing a fluting tool path that's using all X and not using A, if you run it up to 600, it's flat booking at 600 real speed going back. So you gotta be kind of careful with that. What I found to work pretty good is I reduced this stock diameter to one third the actual size. And then it's pretty darn close to program speed. Because if you say that you're running an inch and a half, you know, or the great little test, uh, pieces of wood, you know, half a two before. Uh, you, it's running one third program speed generally. You change that to one third the diameter and it actually speeds up the turning closer to, like if you were running 200 on the bed, this is getting really close to then 200 on the rotary. You gotta play with it. And Tracy didn't mock uh, 
pretty well stopped trying to fix this years ago? Correct. We, we took this to them. So the, the, the theory here, the way that Mach uses this value, this stock diameter right here, is if you put a feed rate of, uh, say, 200 inches a minute or 150 inches a minute, it calculates the circumference, and it's supposed to give you the feed rate on the circumference as if it's laid flat. Um, and so if you have a, you know, a 10 inch diameter, the circumference is uh, 31 inches. If you have a one inch diameter, it's 3.14159 inches. And so you have to turn it at different speeds for, you know, much slower at the larger diameters. Um, but there, somehow their calculation with the A axis and the X is not correct. It's, it's like you said, it's way slow. And so that's why we're, um, we're reducing that stock diameter about one third, and it'll give you more accurate numbers of what you're truly getting when you cut. And, and again, that's on the circumference, uh, you know, on the surface of the wood, uh, the feed rate on it. So I appreciate that tip. All right. Let me just check the chat real quickly and see if I've if any new chat questions have come in that I've lost and then we probably ought to wrap it up tonight. This has been a great class though. Milo, I really appreciate everything you put into this. This is awesome. Um, let me see. Here we go. Hey, Tracy. Yes. While you're doing that, I want to say thank you to Milo for your service, Milo. It's been appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here's military and in, in legacy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's one that comes in. It says this is probably a maintenance, but has anyone had any issue with a runout or backlash with the three by five? Yeah. Backlash is is typically when your your pinion does not or the gear does not fully engage with the rack, which is the linear gear. And that should be adjusted so that you don't have any backlash or play in that. If you over tighten that, it'll run rough as well. So it's it's uh, it's kind of there's a nuance. You have to get it so it's just barely engaged to full depth, so you have no backlash but not over. And we we I think Chris has a video on uh, you know adjusting for backlash, and so I'll have to to look and see if if we've got that and put it up. Or we might do another class on that as well. Can you? like to get one more with <laughs> okay all right um, um milo we've got somebody here asking if he can get uh, your contact information if he could reach out to you would that would that be all right i don't want to pass out information without your permission oh no that's that's fine okay yeah so uh jess you, you can contact me and I'll, I'll get you the information send me an email tracy t-r-a-c-y at legacywoodworking.com okay um, Brian's asking, is the CNC cookbook software good for feeds and speeds? I don't, has anybody had any experience with the CNC cookbook? I've looked at it, but I have not used it, so I, I couldn't really give you any good information. Has anybody else got uh, experience with it? I looked at it here a few years ago, and it was exactly the same thing. It is. Okay, good. So it's valid then. Yeah. Okay. I also have one here about, uh, it's actually regarding different materials, um, that making products out of wood and cast plastic. Obviously, we haven't covered this at all, but uh, plastic, uh, you know, throws in a whole nother uh, conundrum in that if you if your RPM is too high, it'll melt and it fuses back onto the plastic. So it depends on, you know, the acrylic or you know, the type of plastic you're using. But this is one case when we run the spindle RPM really low. You can't make real deep, heavy cuts in plastic because your RPM will be down. I typically run it at about 8,000 RPM. So I just, um, you know, don't cut as deep with plastic. But that's a whole other topic. Um, but just keep in mind that if you're getting melting uh, when you're cutting with plastic, you got to slow that RPM way down or speed, put your feed rates up real high. Typically, I'll slow the RPM down. One additional comment. Add, go to a single flute cutter. For plastic, you're right. For plastic. Yeah, in fact, there are um, old flute um, uh, cutters that are designed specifically for plastic. So I, I know Magnet carries, though. I don't know, if, uh, uh, Milo, do you know if, if Precise Bits carries uh, that type of cutter for plastic? Yes, they do. Yes, I thought so. They, they're really good. <laughs> really, really good. Um, 
um, what is the optimum speed and pass depth using a quarter inch cutting three quarter inch MDF? Okay, so you're going to have to play with this to find out, you know, again, because it depends on your spindle and depends on, um, well, just the same cutters, the same one. I would go two, pa two passes through that, three eighths depths. And uh, probably, Milo, what would you recommend if they're cutting three quarter inch MDF with a quarter inch cutter in two passes? Would you, what would you suggest, do you think? Probably just plug it into the calculator and. Yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, I kind of like somewhere between, like you were saying before, somewhere between 12 and 14,000 RPM. And then just your feed rate till you get the chip load that you want. Okay. Yeah, perfect. The, no, I, I, I do that on that calculator within Vetri. I, I do have experience on this. I was using an eighth inch cutter, cutting out three quarter MDF. Um, and I was using, a, for lack of a better term, a high density MDF. It was a real fine grain. It, was an ex it wasn't your standard MDF that you buy at Home Depot. It's, I buy it from, through a plywood company. And I was doing a, a Lego man last year. And some people will remember that. And I was packing the, 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 with the compression tool pack. And I was running that at 125 on an eighth inch and never broke a bit. Okay. Great. I, I just got a funny, we just got a funny chat in here. <laughs> and it doesn't have a name. It just says owner. It says, I got a lecture from Ron about running too slow in plastic. <laughs> so, I know Ron doesn't usually lecture. He's the nicest guy you ever want to meet, but I think that's funny. <laughs> okay. If there's no other questions, then, uh, wow, I really appreciate it. Again, Milo, hands up. Thank you so much for all of your uh, experience and your, your willing to share with us. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to you again for some other topics as well, because I know you've got so much experience. So we could all give Milo a hand and a, and a thank you. And uh, if there's Thanks. no other questions. Uh, this was a good class, Tracy. This was really good. Yeah, I, I think probably the best so far. So <laughs> thanks to Ron. All right. Or thanks to Milo. I'm sorry. Um, how, soon, how soon do you think this will be posted? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have the recording tomorrow and I'll give that to Chris and it usually takes him about a day. So we could have it by Friday. I'll put a, I'll put a push on it and see if we can get it done by Friday. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end this. And if you, if you have questions still that we haven't caught, uh, just go to our website and use that form under um webinars and you submit questions right in here and i'll gather those up and and put them together and see if we need to come back and revisit this class a little bit more but uh um it's been great so i'm gonna go ahead and close this down and we'll catch you guys all uh, hey by the way i have on the calendar that there is no class next week we're on christmas vacation but that we've made a change i am going to have classes for the next couple of weeks um, so, um, I'll change the calendar, but plan on next week and the week after as well. Right. All right. Good night, everybody.